Hi friends, this is Joe. This is the fourth week of OSR October, one more to go. And for OSR October, I've been looking at Dave Arneson's first fantasy campaign. This is his notes on his Black Bar campaign that he was running uh, before he and Gary Gygax developed D&D. And just looking at the way things were done back then and the way they're done more modernly. <laughs> um, and today I am looking at Wilderness Generation. Okay, Wilderness Generation, The when you say that to me, the first thing that comes to mind is the tables in the back of the Dungeon Master's Guide for First Edition AD&D. Uh, they had some tables, pretty much you start at a hex anywhere and you roll a die or you just pick something, planes, and then um, for every hex from there, you say, okay, the starting hex was planes, so the next one, you roll a die from planes, I rolled a 20, it's going to be mountains. Don't correct me, I just go off the top of my head, I know that's not right. Um, yeah, and then you'd say, oh, but for mountains, you make another roll. And yeah, and you get pretty nice maps that way, it's pretty cool. And going backwards though, in od and it didn't give you any guidance at all because they figured that you were either gonna wanna make your own and you were just gonna do it, you weren't gonna do it randomly, or B, you were going to do what they said and use the outdoor survival map for any outdoor wilderness you wanted to explore. Outdoor Survival, by the way, was a board game published by Avalon Hill that, if you didn't know, the original Dungeons & Dragons game said it was one of the things you should use for the game. Um, yeah, so there you go. I, I do have a copy. It's back in my office on the bookshelf. Anyway... <laughs> But Dave Arneson had a way that he did it. Well, the first thing he says, actually, though, is find a map you like and just steal that one. You know, he says, it seems like any fantasy book these days has a map in it. Just grab that map and use it. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, that's not bad. But he said, if you do want to make your own, there's this procedure. And pretty much his procedure is... You just roll a die, and that die gives you a result of um, hills, woods, wooded hills, or a ghastly swamp. That's it. That's the only type of terrains <laughs> you can generate. No mountains, no deserts, uh, nothing like that. And I wonder if, could it be that that matches the terrain of... Minneapolis, St. Paul. That's where uh, Dave Arneson was. That's where he developed D&D, uh, &D, Blackmore, all that fun stuff. It is the birthplace of the hobby. I've only been there once, not counting airplane stops. That's like a little regional hub for us. So a lot of times when we fly somewhere, we have to go through Minneapolis. But uh, yeah, one of that describes the terrain. Ghastly swamps, hills, woods, wooded hills. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, you do that. But what strikes me as interesting is the level of detail that he gets into when he's doing this. Because I've always done wilderness as kind of like, yeah, you walk in, you go for 15 miles, whatever, and you come across a mountain range. And, you know, that will go for however. Or you come across some hills. Okay, because they're hills, they're going to slow down your movement rate to this and whatever. And you, you just press on and you roll with it. But he gets into great detail, like on the hills. And I'm just going to read you one of the entries. The first one, it's not the most detailed. It's not the least detailed. It's just the first one. And it, it gives you an idea. So this is what Dave says. Uh, the first one is heavily wooded. He says that the hex is 40 to 90% wooded. And then he tells you how to generate that. No, he actually says 30 to 90%, but it's impossible to get 30% based on his technique. Anyway, he says that there are, are zero to one hills in the area and that the hills are one or two, depending on the die roll, contours. Uh, each contour is, by the way, 100 feet high. He doesn't say that. So the hills could be one to 200 feet high. These hills are one to six miles long and one to four miles wide. They will be scattered at random like populations, but they should all have the same long axis with each other. 
Otherwise, they are random directions. Roll as the wind. Uh, if they cross each other, add one contour to the area where the cross occurs. For the woods, roll for each subsection. Ask for the low. Yeah, ask for the location of local populations using the basic percentage of woods in the square as established above. When near wo water, <laughs> add 20% to the chances of woods, and when on hills, reduce the percentile by 20%. There's a 30% of human habitation within the square. So what I find interesting there is the level of detail. The fact that this hill is six miles long and two miles wide. Um, that this hex has two hills in it. Where, like I said, I always just thought, okay, this is a hilly hex. We're going to reduce your... And I guess that comes from the wargaming background, right? Because if we want to take our armies out there and we want to have a battle, where we choose for our battle site is important uh, because of the, the terrain. Yeah, they, if you know, going back to the, those days, uh, Dave and Gary, they had sand tables, right? These big tables... Um, filled with sand so that they could mold this terrain and make them to play their games on. So you could see who had the high ground and who had to go uphill and all that stuff. I've never done that. I'm, would I do that today? No. <laughs> oh, the other interesting thing is he said each subsection. So what he, he does is he takes a hex and he breaks it down to 87 one square mile blocks, which means that he knew his stuff because you do the math and you take a 10 mile hex. But <laughs> side note, they've used 10 mile hexes. And I only bring that up because, well, one, well, we're coming into it. But the reason I'm making it a side note is because there's like almost this holy war <laughs> in the OSR community, whether a hex should be 10 miles or, sorry, <laughs> whether a hex should be five miles or six miles. I have my own solution. I'm not going to bring it up here. I will make that a short video someday. Um, but like I said, it's almost a holy war. It should be six miles. It should be five miles. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I guess the honest answer is it should be 10 miles, at least according to Dave Arneson. Um, that's what he used. Interestingly enough, uh, OD&D didn't say anything, but they did say to use outdoor survival. And outdoor survival, the hexes are three miles. So maybe it should be a three mile hex. But yeah, to get into that. Oh, so he takes his, his 10 mile hex and he breaks it up into 87 one square mile chunks, which mathematically is pretty darn accurate. If you calculate the area of a 10 mile hex, it's pretty spot on. And so what you do is you roll percentile die and you find out which square in the hex it is. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm showing you that hex right now. And that's neat. And he also says for each of those hex, because it's a heavily wooded hex, you go in and you roll for each of those squares to see which one is woods and which one is clearing. And I mean, that's going to give you a very detailed map. I've, I've never done that. I've never gotten that detailed. Um, and maybe I should. I don't know. Uh, actually, I'm going to say no, I shouldn't. Um, because... What I do works for me, and it works for the way I run the game. Although it might be interesting to try this as an experiment. Um, yeah. But the question that Dave answers for me that I have had for the longest time. Okay, Billy Joel, get out of my head. Um, for the longest time, Billy Joel's song. Anyway, <laughs> the question that he answers is, let me tell you why the question is important. When you become a named level, a lord in OD&D, &D, ninth or 10th level uh, fighter, you can set up a stronghold and then you can collect taxes um, on that area. And the area is 20 square miles, no, that's 20, 20 miles all around your stronghold, which in 10 mile hexes is nice because that means it's, Two hexes. <laughs> um, anyway, in AD&D, &D, it's 20 to 50 miles. But one of the things you have to do, though, is clear that area of all monsters. And the way you do that is by finding all the lairs. But how many lairs are in the hex? Dave tells us. Dave says that there are zero to five miles. Yep, sorry, wrong. Zero to five lairs per hex. 
ADD never tells you. <laughs> and so that question has been in my mind for the longest time. And I thought that ODD didn't tell you, but I looked it up today and it semi sort of kind of does. And it pretty much says when your force enters the hex, roll for a random encounter. And ODD random encounters happen roughly one in three chance, 33% chance. It's one in two on a six sided die. And I say roughly because. Some terrain types is only on a one. Some terrain types is one to three. The average is one to two. And if you get a, if you get a random encounter, then that means that creature has a lair there. And then you have this. But I love this idea of having the hex and you already know that it has zero to five and you'd roll them in advance. I imagine that Dave said roll 1d6 minus one. I would probably do it as like 2d4 minus 2. That gives you 0 through 6. Just treat the 6 as a 0. And uh, yeah, give me some more bell curvy, less, you know, swingy. I, I like that. I would, but I like that. And then you scatter them randomly, you know, using these percentile dice, uh, the way he broke down the hex. And you know where they are. And then you can do some pretty decent plopping through the the wilderness uh, by the players trying to find the lairs for these monsters. And of course, then when you roll random encounters, they come from those zero to five monster types that uh, you have the lairs for in that hex. And, and that's pretty cool. I think that can make a cool level of play. I, I do like that. So the only other thing I'm going to say about this is that Dave talks about random encounters and how he does those in the wilderness. And it's a little different and I like it. And so I'm going to Read it to you right now. If you're on YouTube, you can see it on the screen. This is what Dave says. If encounter is indicated, roll for which group is met. Equal chances of encountering each. And by that, by group, I'm assuming that he means the monsters that have lairs in there. Roll the probability for the chance of group being met in lair. Well, I guess that solidifies that, right? Because if they don't have a lair, how could they be in lair? 10 to 60 of the group will be out of the lair. 40 plus will be in the lair. And then it says for groups out of the lair, it gives you some rules for how to determine where they are. So two things about this. The first is that when you get to the lair, not everyone's going to be in the lair. And for some reason, I never thought about that. And it makes perfect sense because if you think about percent in lair, that means like for a band of orcs, right? If it says 30% in lair, that means that, yes, when you encounter a band of orcs, there's, that means there's about a 30% chance. I know that number is not right. Don't tell me. It's an example. <laughs> that means that there's a 30% chance that they're in the lair. But that means when you're in the lair, that, then there's only about 30% of them should be there, right? Because 70% of them are probably out somewhere else. I, I like that. It makes sense. Um, the other thing is that, as with most things in First Fantasy campaign, uh, these are Dave's notes over years, right? Dave started doing Blackmore around 1971. And it was 77 when this first got published by Judges Guild. So that's, that's six years. Uh, but even over three years uh, to get D&D published, things change over time. So in the one section, he says, roll the location of the lair so you know where the lairs are. Then this says, roll to see if they're in the lair. Um, if you know where you are, you know where the lair are is. So it's just, I think it's two different techniques from two separate times. Um, I like the first technique better rather than, oh, I came across a monster. Is it in his lair? I like knowing, hey, there are lairs over there. You're like here, three miles away. And then that leads to a thing. Hey, we found this troll. Where's its lair? Uh, will there be more trolls? There? I think you could have deeper and more interesting play that way. Uh, yeah. So overall, I've been kind of doing this thing where do I like the old way better or the new way better? 50-50. Uh, <laughs> For terrain generation, I like I like my new, even loosey goosier way. You know, people talk about how to generate. I just take a piece of paper and I go over there and I say mountains. And I go over here, I say hills, woods. I don't roll any dice. I just, I, I do it like that. Um, and big globs because 
When you ever have a random mountain sitting all by itself, the lonely mountain, yeah, okay, we're not going to go there. But, right, mountains live in ranges, and so you just take your pencil and you shade in the whole section and you say, mountains. <laughs> um, woods, right? Yeah. <laughs> woods, no woods. Woods, that, that's, it's woods. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I just do it in very big, broad strokes like that, and good enough for gaming. But, for this Lara thing, I love that. And that I would 100% steal. Oh, I ran this campaign. Uh, James was one of the players in that one. Peter was not. Um, but I ran this campaign, and it was called The Barony. And I had been reading OD&D at one point. And, you know, it says that thing. When you reach 10th level, 9th level, <laughs> when you become a lord, you can become a baron and set up your own territory. And so the basis of the campaign was that this uh, lady had met that level and she was going out to set up her own territory. And the players were part of her entourage that were following her that were going to populate that town that she was setting up. And uh, so to dig up that campaign and to use these rules about the letters and stuff, I think that would be pretty darn cool. Uh, actually, I'm very tempted to do that. Uh, but yeah, so that's all I have for this week. Thanks for watching and or listening. Uh, if you liked, disliked, whatever, have any comments at all, feel free to send them along on YouTube. You can comment below on anything. You can send me an email at feedback at decahedron.com. If you want to leave voicemail, you can call our feedback line. It's in the show notes or it's on the screen right now. And, uh, oh, or you can go to say hi.chat slash decahedron. That's useful if, say, you're overseas and you don't want to uh, make a long-distance call, but you still want to do voice. Of course, you can always just attach a voicemail file into an email that you send to the, well, well, the email address. Anyway, <laughs> again, thanks for watching and your listening. And until next time, happy gaming, happy life. Bye. Thanks for listening.